Now, this was down at the engine room, and I want to go up in the helicopter view. And I've taken this graph from Charles Murray, uh, which published this in a book called Human Accomplishment in 2003. But in the past 20 years, there's been a number of authors which have looked into how come that certain places in the world seem to have just done a lot of things me measuring this in science, in arts, in music, whatever you want to look at, whereas other areas haven't really accomplished a lot of things. And this is, uh, I think this is the science uh, part, uh, where you can see Europe. The black one is uh, uh, a couple of minor countries here, uh, west of Europe and uh, down under. Um, and then you have a small gray dot uh, down in the corner. But you can see that, that Europe seemed to have accomplished a lot of things over the years. And you may also notice that there's like two kinks on this curve. And I can tell you that a lot of authors have looked into what these kinks are. But it looked like they are the Reformation, which took place in the 1500s, and the Enlightenment, which took place in the 1700s. And what was this about? This was about that we eventually got, got rid of the straitjacket which the church, church had uh, wrapped around us in the 1500s. And in the 1700s, we, um, it was people like John Locke, Jacques Rousseau, and a lot of other people, which really encouraged free thinking of the individual uh, and broke up, you could say, the rigid social structures in society, allowing social migration and allowing and encouraging free thinking in society. And if you, again, I just mentioned three of the books where, where this is actually discussed, but there's actually a handful more in the past 20 years, as I mentioned. Uh, the conclusion from this is really what this is all about is set the individual free avoid too many rules and restrictions, especially avoid centralization, and ensure that the incentives are there for people to do something, to make a difference. And apparently, some places in the world is better at doing this uh, than others, and I don't know if, if it's a sign, which we have to be a little careful about, but it looks like Europe is kind of flattening out in, in, in recent times. And then, uh, you know, just to, uh, as an example, I have uh, borrowed this slide from Thomas Salmonson. Uh, it's an old slide, so it's probably been much better and more easy to understand, but just an example on the EU regulatory system. And then you can ask the question, well, do the EU regulatory system provide this space for innovation which the authors pointed out in the previous slide was the basis for the success of the European societies through centuries. Deliberately, I avoided taking in the HTA and pricing part here because uh, then we would all be uh, shocked. Then uh, shifting to something else, and this is a, a article published in New York in 2011 with the title Cowboys and Pit Crews. It was a speech given by uh, the guy Gavanda in the bottom to the graduation ceremony for the medical student at Harvard University in, in June 2011. And the question he asked basically was, what's the similarity between cowboys and pit crews? And the similarities here is that both work on the basis of a project culture. And the cowboys is all about taking care of the cows and ensuring that the cows are well and that they are you know, herded and brought from field to field to where there's good and juicy grass. And the pit crews is also all about keeping uh, the race car on the racetrack as much as possible and in best possible shape so it drives as fast as possible. And 
It should be no secret that the healthcare system, obviously this is only something which happened in, the, in Denmark and the US maybe, the healthcare system is still structured the way it was more or less structured 150 years ago, not with the patient being in the center, but with the specialities in silos to the hospital. So when people come in with comorbidities, it's a nightmare for the hospital to figure out how to take care of both diabetes, a broken leg, hypertension, myocardial infarct, and I don't know what. So could we imagine a system where we have a matrix which is centered around a project which is the patient with a project leader? And remember the project leader, the word leader is somebody which is not managing things, but which is leading things to the best of the patient. This has been tried uh, in a couple of places in the world with uh, interesting uh, uh, examples. Um, but I would actually like to point to a YouTube video about the pit crews called uh, Invention in Formula One from 1950 to today. There you can actually see what happened in uh, Formula One racing in 60 years, and then you can think about whether that exemplifies what happened in the healthcare system. I'll leave the conclusion to you. But anyway, turning to, uh, to personalized medicine, the vision we have here is that biology and a different conceptual approach to the patient will bring us from just looking at a population of people to actually look at the individual and based on their, you could say, genetic or biological fingerprint, actually, uh, you know, tailor the treatment and services we offer them to this particular pe person. I would like to say that a lot of the examples we got yesterday is coming out from uh, areas like cancer and rare diseases where we know a lot of the signs but I can tell you all the diseases which I work with in my 30 years in pharma industry is all diseases where we really don't know much about the biology. We know something, but not enough to tailor medicine and treatment down to the, you could say, the real individual. We know, however, a lot about who respond and who don't respond to the medicines, but this is typically not applied in real life, and I'll come back to why that is. I like to exemplify this by shoes because um, people, you know, normally say, well, it sounds very complicated, can we really do this? Well, uh, you know, it, it's not more than two or three generations ago that you, at least in Denmark, uh, got like two or three pairs of shoes in your whole life, and uh, you had to fit the shoe, not the other way around. Um, and I can also tell you that Somewhat east of here, there was a country which until early 60s actually only produced one uni shoe which fit, should fit both left and right and only in a few sizes. And then again, your foot had to fit that shoe. We are now to the right here uh, where you can actually buy a shoe which fit uh, uh, your foot. And I can tell you that this is now so advanced that we actually invested in companies where you put your foot into a box which then scan the foot and 3D print the sole, where you then can fit whatever top of the shoe you want on. So, I mean, demonstrate that shoe technology seems to be a little more advanced than health technology. Also, just to remind you why healthcare is important for us, the guy to the right here is horrendously expensive for society and for his insurance company. And what society wants is really to push everybody to the right so they actually is part of the working population, earn their own money, pay taxes, etc., etc. So this is what it's all about. It's an investment in a healthy population. This is the basis and the foundation for any modern society. Sometimes we tend to forget that. Then this is a favorite slide of mine, and this is about who actually pays the patient value chain. And if you start out from the left, this is really when this young girl starts to feel sick for whatever reason, then the employer will experience this as a productivity loss for, from this person. Then next step is really when she is diagnosed with whatever it could be, she is treated, 
she is rehabbed, she is deemed well, coming back to work, but still not at full speed, and then eventually she is full recovered. And then, you know, who is paying each of these steps? The yellow ones, and, and, and this is obviously only the case in Denmark, so won't do any conclusions outside Denmark. The yellow ones are paid by the healthcare system in Denmark. And the healthcare system in Denmark is incentivized to kick out people from the treatment as quickly as possible. They're only paid for treating, and it's better for them the shorter it is. Who is paying for their productivity loss? Well, the em employer is paying for that. Who is paying for the sickness days? Well, insurance companies or counties, et cetera, et cetera. So you see there's different payers all along the value chain, dependent upon which disease you are talking about. You have the ballpark of the cost in various in, each of the, in various of these boxes. And let me give you an example. Cancer. The majority of the cost is at the yellow box, the uh, diagnosis and treatment. But if you take mental diseases, it's the red ones which are the big one. And I can tell you, if you take depression as an example, that's where we have numbers from UK, uh, uh, Sweden, and uh, Canada, you actually have that 85% of the total cost of depression is in the two read the, the productivity logs boxes. What the healthcare system does today is obviously because they have a budget they need to stay within, is that they prioritize their investment based on where they, they, they see the burden. So they prioritize things like cancer, um, whereas they don't prioritize depression, which is outside the healthcare system most of the, co <clears throat> of the cost. And here I can recommend the Proartin Medicine Report from WHO, which actually calculate most of the diseases here and see how the burden on society uh, really uh, looks like. And they compare that to the investment in the various diseases by the, uh, the healthcare system. So where to apply the personal medicine approach? We already yesterday heard about that you could go in as your biological knowledge increased day by day and sub-segment the patient dependent upon their biological fingerprint and tell who respond and who would not respond from a given medicine. And just to remind you, this is a slide from uh, an old paper from Thomas Lundgren about non-responder rates in, in various categories. The problem with this is, who's going to pay for this? The companies, they won't pay. Why should they? Because this effort is going to limit their market size. So why should they pay for this? So I think we need to find a mechanism which actually addresses an incentive for actually looking into this so we avoid that ethical issue it is to treat people which really have no benefit for the treatment. Next one is to apply it in the process of medicine development. And here there was an interesting article in uh, Discovery, in uh, Nature Reviews Drug Discovery a couple of years back, showing that around 80% of phase two projects in development actually had a biomarker making it possible to differentiate between responders and non-responders. But as you went to phase three, very few of them had. Why is that? Well, where is the incentive to just focus in on responders? You will just have a smaller market, and there's no incentive in the current system to really go for responders only. And the last one is applying prevention. I already gave uh, an example on, on uh, the disease which I can't pronounce. Uh, but again, the issue is who's going to pay for this? It's going to Long-term give you a lot of payback to society, but right now it's a cost and there's nobody who is incentivized to pay for that. So wrapping up uh, on a couple of these issues, I do see as we get more and more knowledge that disease quotation as it's done today is going to break down and uh, we will have uh, diseases which are defined based on their biology. And the example, again, is cancer, where we can take the BRCA-driven uh, 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 breast cancer. 
but bracket-driven cancers also is found in ovaries and lung cancer, and it makes no sense to call it either lung, breast, or ovary cancer, but you should basically use a nomenclature reflecting the biology. And the biology will then uh, direct the therapy, therapies. And the problem here comes that the diagnostic test will then help you diagnosing those with the molecular fault we're talking about. And um, we would also need to follow these patients, which will be much fewer than we know from a diseased population today, uh, longer to really capture real-world data. Remember the clinical trials we are doing today are generally very artificial in the setup and in the population you test, very different from what is actually happening out in real world where it's often a lot of comorbidities you're talking about. We also have that the current standards used in drug development today doesn't really adapt well to uh, the smaller population we're talking about here. I should say the rare disease area has paved the way in this. Also, uh, the current pathways, and now we're talking both, uh, both uh, the regulatory and payer here, is not really harnessing all the tools available, and especially the last one which was discussed yesterday, namely the difference between risk assessment, whether you are well educated and not yet diagnosed, and sitting in CHMP and evaluating the risk of a given medicine versus a patient which knows he's going to die in three months and is willing to try everything. Here I think we need a much better integration of that two different risk approaches. Then I think we'll just oops, uh, take the next two because one of the problems, as I alluded to, is that the fixed pricing system we have in Europe don't really incentivize going into the smaller populations, optimizing the patient population for your drug, another thing which, which needs to be uh, addressed in, in Challenge 4. So I think uh, I won't go into a lot of details here, but just say that a lot of this was discussed yesterday, and I couldn't agree more. But I think the biggest hurdle in my mind is really about the business model, the fundamental business model for the pharmaceutical industry is challenged here. There is right now absolutely no incentive to go for a well-defined population you know is going to respond to your medicine, and we need to ensure that such an incentive is in fact in place. So conclusions and uh, my predictions. I think uh, a personalized or more individualized approach to healthcare that will be the future of the healthcare system. And I also think that the future healthcare system will be different from we, what we know today in the respect that today it's a disease care system. So it's interesting that most people which own a car actually go to the garage and get a, like a tune up once in a while. But do you do that if you're not sick? Do you go to get a tune-up? No, nobody does that. It's kind of weird. Um, and I think we need to, to think about how that um, needs to be done. And then the final thing is that we are moving into areas which are so complex that this can only be done like a close collaboration between all the stakeholders in the value chain. And just to recall, this is from basic research to real-world patients, including authorities, financial ministries, which are those keeping track of the budget, which is probably the limiting factor in this transition period. So with these words, thanks for your attention. I think we have time for one or two questions, if there should be any. Okay.